Welcome. Namaste. Hi, I'm Bruce Benefield, and welcome to One World. Hi again, and welcome to this week's edition of One World. Namaste is actually from the Brahmi language, which is the predecessor to Sanskrit. It simply means, I worship what is within you. Imagine if we could all do that walking down the street and recognize that in each other and build that so that we can have a harmonious world. This evening's guests are Alice Navarro Whitehouse and Richard Valenzuela. Now, Alice. White House is the publisher of Extend Magazine. It's a multicultural magazine, and she publishes articles on how business is integrating a multicultural perspective. Richard Valenzuela is the executive director of the National Conference of Christians and Jews, and he's also the coordinator for a project here in Arizona called Anytown, excuse me, Anytown, and he's also one of the co-founders of Arizona Affirmative Action. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome them both. Alice, Richard, glad to have you here. Thank you to be here, Mr. Alice, now you've got some interesting background. You're, you're from Panama originally. What got you started with the, the multicultural perspective with the magazine here? Well, I, from my Christian perspective, I've always known that uh, God made us, you know, all, and that we need to live in peace. And when I came to America, I encountered a lot of the barriers that go with, you know, different cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, not knowing the, the language, not speaking English properly, not, not writing it properly. A lot of, uh, I encountered a lot of barriers because of that, to communication and to understanding. And I've always been interested in, in bridging that gap, if you, if, you, mm -hmm. if you will. I just never knew how to approach it. Uh, I didn't know how to call some of the things that I experienced. And uh, many times it was frustrating, but for the most part I have had good experiences, and those good experiences have enabled me now to reach out. And mm -hmm. this is what got me into this. Was there any one in particular experience that you had let's say on an inner level or on a level that you didn't really understand that you now do that led you to the, the publishing of the magazine? Um, both. I've had a, an inner, inner uh, experience of a, a very, very strong uh, commitment that has come within me uh, to do something. Uh, in order to contribute to, um, especially in the workplace, Mm -hmm. contribute to understanding, contribute to harmony, right. contribute to people being treated in a humane way, not as machines. Um, right. I, I have had a lot of respect for people in the business world. They have titles and they have education, but the minute I see them treating another human being, uh, you know, with less respect or, or bad, my respect for them sort of diminishes. Yeah, it, it's tough to realize sometimes in a, in a corporate environment or something mm -hmm. like that that we all put our pants on the same way. That's or skirts. That's, you know. perfect. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Richard, what, what got you started with the, the council? And uh, well, first, first of all, what I'd like to find out is what got you started in the founding of the Affirmative Action? Here in Arizona. Well, the Affirmative Action Association is, is um, basically was just an outcome of some of the work that we'd already done in the area of mm -hmm. human relations and prejudice reduction. And we were working with labor management relations at, at the time. This was 16 years ago. And we thought, you know, with the coming of Affirmative Action Equal Employment field, it was a, a good way to, to 
not only help, um, I guess, bridge a gap and work with minorities and women to so they can reach their highest potential, but here was to train corporations and executives to provide them the information that they needed in order to do that kind of work and do it and do it properly. It was a you know fast moving, changing field 16 years ago. You bet. You bet. There's a lot of things happening. Mm -hmm. Then what got you started with the, uh, or what got you involved with the Council of Christian Jews? Basically, uh, I, when I was a high school senior, I attended, I was invited to attend one of their uh, Denny Town Human Relations Program, which was started here in Arizona in 1957. And I attended in 1965, and I was so intrigued by the whole concept area that I'd, I'd been searching for something like this, because I had seen prejudice, I'd seen discrimination, I've seen people hurt. And I thought this was a very positive way, an educational way, by bringing people together, allowing them to live with each other, mm -hmm. we tend to overcome some of the fears that keep us apart. Now, any age. time basically is, or any town, is set up uh, with children in mind. Basically, high school high age school. students. Mm -hmm. we, we take uh, 100, uh, well, right now we're up to six camps now where we're taking 85 to 90 students from all over the state and some from across the nation and bring them together for one week of living with each other. And we, we take into consideration that it's multiracial, multi-religious, uh, multi-cultural in every different way. And mm -hmm. uh, we even consider geographic mix and economic mix. Any special success stories you've had come out of that? Oh, well, we've had, you know, I, you know, one thing about the experience, we get calls from people, well, we're, we're into the, about, well, we're into the second, might you be into the third generation of people that are just sending their, their children or now their grandchildren to the program. So I think that tells you something. They don't necessarily remember the particular experience or what went on, but they never forget the experience of, of being up there for six nights and seven days. Oh, that's going to be a phenomenal thing so, to be involved yeah. in. Yeah, it's a very now, Alice, in moving through your uh, seeming dysfunctions in, in, in the United States, <laughs> the, you know, you mentioned you the, the language barrier, and well, it, it seems like a dis, uh, like a dysfunction when you're coming into another culture uh -huh. and you're having to change around. Uh, what kind of fears did you encounter, and how did you overcome them? Well, um, a good example of the dysfunction and people, you know, they when I when I get invited as a speaker or, or to to conduct a seminar the first thing I tell people is that I came to this country and barely knew how to speak English but then when it came to writing or reading that was another thing altogether different and uh, though having an independent spirit I used to go to the store once in a while my husband was away when he was around I never had any problems but when when I went by myself I always picked up the wrong thing and uh, an, exa an example of that, one time I picked up a uh, um, can of hairspray, which is, you know, I, you go by feel and you see, you see the things that are shaped, almost the same thing, and I picked up this can and I put it on my hair and I see all this foam coming out of the can and I didn't know what it was. And my friends that were waiting for me to take me to this party started laughing. They said, this is wood life for the rug. They said, this is not your scale. <laughs> and uh, another time I picked up a can of tuna, uh, you know, a whole bunch. Actually, uh, it, they were on sale. And I thought, how wonderful That's coming from, huh? yeah, wonderful, uh, you know, coming from Panama and liking seafood. And it, it turned out to be uh, can, can tuna for, for, for cats, actually, you know, that kind of stuff. And, but it was a very good casserole, let me tell you. My, my, my neighbors still, still tell me about that casserole. They'll never forget it. But no, it is that way. And I've talked with people like from Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they came in the, uh, like the so-called boat people, uh, that they, they saw uh, one lady to say she saw this Crisco can and he had this beautiful uh, chicken uh, picture and she didn't know how to read English so she picked it up on the picture she thought that's what is in the can and when she took it home she see this white stuff and she doesn't know what to do with it and many many people go through that you'd sure. be surprised um, I had a friend of mine who was in Japan he says he couldn't tell the difference between shampoo and shave cream. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. These are. It, it does make people dysfunctional in some ways, but 
Um, when I came, though, it was uh, the climate, the whole climate was, well, if you have a minority, that's all you need. It, you know, it, mm -hmm. it is, a, is a token. In many companies, I was the only minority. In some others, I was a part of a very, very uh, few uh, members of that population, and in my, always in my department, I was the only one. So they didn't know at times what to do with me, and, and you know, and the, the communication problem was, and so I reacted at times with frustration, no and I would let it get negative, you know, instead mm -hmm. of positive. And this is what we're trying now to get management, people in positions of authority, to understand what kind of approaches they need to take in order to deal with these problems. And to honor the people in the process. That's right. right. To respect, yes, right. respect people. Richard, I don't know that you would have encountered any fears other than those that you might have created within yourself as far as the, the success of the program. But did you? Did, did you have anything that you needed to work through and uh, and how did you do it? As far as the uh, running or the creation of the Anytown program? Uh, mm -hmm. there's with that whole scenario, what came up within you that you had to deal with in order to, to be successful with it? Um, that's hard to say. I, you know, I'm, um, to be successful with it, I, I think once you get people together, mm -hmm. I think part of it is, is convincing people sometimes that it's okay to let their child go to a program like this, especially coming from a religious perspective or maybe their own cultural fears. Like I remember, we used to have difficulty with getting Hispanic females to be allowed to come to program with this away from their from their homes because of the Hispanic culture, right. saying, "Hey, we don't allow the girls to go out by themselves." And so uh, we had to overcome that in in our relationship with working with the culture. Um, I think we've ran into it to some degree with the Asian culture also over the years. Uh, to, for people to let go to some degree to allow their sons and daughters to to integrate to find out about others. I think can be a fear for a lot of people and a lot of families. Uh, but I think, you know, for the most part, we've overcome most of those. Um, uh, we're working, you know. Did you have any period of time where you saw an issue come up and you just had a real difficult time in thinking how you could get through it in those initial stages? You know, we're talking about working through the, mm -hmm. the cultural... Well, even right now, you know, one of the issues that has come up, um, it's not so much, well, I, I, we, I consider it a cultural issue, but it's more like a female-male cultural issue. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's an epidemic of date rape occurring uh, uh, all across the country, especially with young with young people, right. and we brought that issue into being about uh, about three or four years ago into the program, and we still got a lot of resistance, even some some of our other staff or volunteer staff, about uh, is this an issue we should be dealing with? Can we deal with what the outcome is if you start talking about date rape mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. assault? Uh, are we going too far? You know, it's much like when we used to talk about racial issues. People were saying, how far can you go? Watch out. Right. Now they're saying the same thing with some of these sexual issues that I think we need to deal with. Yeah, it's something that's been stuffed, mm -hmm. um, you know, back in the corner that I don't think any generation has truly brought it out and dealt with it. It seems to be being brought out a lot more now where the issue is being put on the table and people are talking about it more freely. Mm -hmm. However, it's still a, a, a sensitive issue with a lot of people. Yeah, homophobia is another issue that we're still having to deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alice, how do you see the, the things that you're doing blending into a, a multicultural experience? What kind of a, effects do you see it having? Well, the effect that I see is that the workplace of becoming uh, easier for people to to communicate, to work together. Uh, management is realizing that because it has been predicted, it is already a fact, that by the year 2000, a lot more of the workforce will consist of women and minorities and immigrants. Mm -hmm. And because the the uh, the components of, of, of this population have uh, many different angles to deal with. They can no longer treat it just as something that you sweep under the rug. And you know sure. now we have this female who, uh, you know, I, I represented women and minorities and immigrants. I mean, you're only one person, but now they have many, and they have also 
disabled people, older workers that are going back to work because they're retired, but they, they're not they able to financial, yeah. financially afford to, to stay uh, away. They have a lot more mothers, and they have to deal with many, many other issues that they, they used to basically ignore. So what I see, the effects that I see is basically dealing with these issues uh, head on and making it work for them, you know, using the talents and the capitalize, capitalize on this diversity of people and all the experiences and, and contributions that they can make in order to succeed mm -hmm. and to remain competitive. You see, because if they don't do that, then they will have a lot more turnover. You know, and that that's is going sure. to if have a keep people in. That's right. If they if they hire people and take the time and the money to to give them training, they want to keep them. They won't want to turn them over to the competition. Sure. So, uh, dealing with that, I see good effects of what we're doing uh, right now. My main mission with the magazine, by the way, just in case your 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 audience has okay. never seen it, here is the magazine. This is the premier issue. Let's see. Well, here, that's, that'll do good right there. Oh, thank How's you. That? And this was the second issue of the magazine, and the mission we have is to through interviews and articles and other features give some of the information to people in management that they need to more or less recognize some of these challenges that are coming up and how right. to overcome them. Because yeah, just working in the, in the workplace and focusing on that particular issue is not enough for a lot of people now. That's they want right. to be able to be themselves in the workplace. Not that they're being destructive in any way, no. but they're just being more caring about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know for myself, uh, several years ago, was working for an aerospace firm, suggesting having interpersonal skills classes in our department, and that became a threat to the managers. I wasn't wise enough at that time to recognize that issue. And how to overcome it. Right. Mm -hmm. I found out a year and a half later, uh, after I was gone, that they did institute, you know, <laughs> some type of uh, interpersonal skills classes throughout the management levels. But at least, you know, maybe I uh, planted a seed. And, and That's right, that you came planted to fruition. a seed. Richard, how do you see things coming together multiculturally with the, let's say, the Anytown uh, program? That's probably the one that you're most active in? Well, not only multicultural, uh, not only an, a program like Anytown, which, you know, we feel we've been a multicultural program for 35 years. It mm -hmm. just wasn't called that. I feel that multiculturalism now is, is going to, is a necessary thing rather than a luxury or, mm -hmm. or a good philosophical idea like it has been in the past, the same way with affirmative action. Um, now the reality is that the workforce is changing, the population of America is changing, the color of America is changing, mm -hmm. and we've got to accept it. We can't run away. Um, I mean, part of the re reasons why we may be having some of the racial problems or prejudicial problems or issues that are occurring is there's a fear out there. There's a, a xenophobia of some sort. Right. So uh, I think we just got to, you know, look at the advantages and take it with us, and also the whole idea of being global. You mm -hmm. know, we're just not an isolated America anymore. Nope. Right. It is a global experience. I mean, just in recent times, we've had the wall in Berlin come down. We've had the, <laughs> you know, the downfall, so to speak, of Russia as a nation, and people are beginning to, to speak up. Now, for Arizona alone, we're what, 51% Hispanic? Is that? No, we're not that high yet. We're approximately 20, 23, I believe, was the last person age I saw. But you see, there's an, un there's an uncounted number out there that people do not know. Right. But that is a, a truism that as far as the increased immigration rates mm -hmm. that are increasing tremendously. And, and as walls come down all over the world, immigration is going to increase. Um, How do you see them coming down? Well, I think, uh, you know, just like the communist system, I think, has been, has been you know, people, you know, if, uh, I think people have just found out that you only carry a system of, of division only so long. That's right. It's, it's amazing how those ethnic feelings have been there for 70 years and did not go away. Mm -hmm. that, that feeling of 
and I think ethnicity is very important. Uh, one of the things we teach our young people is, or one of the things we discovered over the years in our young people, is that one of the reasons why many minorities or people of color have low self-esteem is because they haven't accepted that they are equal or that they're good enough. That's that they've right. been second-class citizens for so many years. Mm -hmm. And so it's that self-esteem building that, that comes out of identifying your cultural identity and being proud of it. Uh, I haven't even, I have it even as a white boy. <laughs> it's, um, some of us, it's a fear of success. You, know, yeah. you have things in front of you that, that could just totally expand your life, mm -hmm. and you come up to it and you're used to other patterns, and this is a new one, mm -hmm. and it, it's kind of, um, it's real testy. You don't really know how to deal with it and open up to it. Yeah. How do you see things coming about and, and the barriers coming down, Alice? Well, I go about uh, things now asking questions. I ask people, do you see, you know, progress? What kind of progress do you see? Um, and what kind of role are you willing to play to make the progress? Because, you see, right. uh, we can all sit down and complain about all the things that are wrong, but if you don't get up there and get involved, in some kind of way and play some role to bring things uh, to change, to be a change agent, then, you know, I, I, in my opinion, you better not complain. Simple and analogy is if you're pointing a finger at something, look real close at your <laughs> hand. you got three of them coming back at you. That's right. You know. So I ask people, what roles are you willing to play to get this going? And the ones that are already in it, I ask them, what kind of progress they see. And I am, I am very, very happy to tell you that things are coming along a lot faster than I ever thought they would. And to me, that is a blessing to all of us. If we want America to remain uh, the number one economy in the world and a leader as, as we should be, um, we have to do this. We have to address the the issues that you know put put a lot of tension whether it's racial tension whether it's gender tension whether it's um, gender uh, I'm sorry uh, generational gaps mm -hmm. you know between different ages uh, we we have to accept people whatever whoever they are with the baggage they bring and try to see through that to find the most positive thing they have in order for them to be uh, contributors. Excellently put. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't have said it better. Richard, what kind of, of things do you see that, that people can do in their own lives to make things better for them in the way that they interact in society, in their personal lives, and in business? I think I think we each have to look at ourselves and and see uh, what prejudices we we may have, uh, what barriers we have put up that keep us from reaching out to other people um, and accepting other people. One of the reasons why I, I got into this work was I thought the whole the whole area of of interracial relationships in the 50s and 60s being so foreign and so out of place and and uh, and people are still coming up and saying, you know, we have the purity of races, which I believe is is totally false. Uh, I think we need to be able to accept each other, and not have these fears or these perceptions of the worst of other people. Do you feel that those are built in, or do you feel that those are enforced by the media? No, I don't know. Or reinforced by the media. I think media plays a role, but I think our parents and our and our people that we associate with reinforce it even more sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I, none of us are born bi to be bigots or racists, but we sure learn very quickly. The reason yeah. I asked about the media is because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alice and her magazine, okay. I um, think media can take both, both, both sides. Yeah. I think you've seen some very positive things come across in the media and then some very negative reinforcements. So. Well, that's the role I want to play. I want to be and the side of the media that try to to uh, use the, the medium for positive to make things uh, better. 
for everybody. We're all in this together, you know. That's and it. I believe um, there's an, also a book that we, we've put together. It's called Cultural Diversity Management, A New Perspective. And that is uh, for management people to, to get uh, a feel for some of the issues, but not just from the point of view of a PhD or, mm -hmm. or somebody who's an educator. Sometimes uh, there's educated idiots, too. Yeah. You know, they've just gone through school and don't yeah, know beans is, about well, real life. Well, more from, from my point of view as a person who has walked in those shoes, you know. Mm -hmm. and I have experienced the stereotypes, the discrimination, or a, a very, very acute sense of misunderstanding because of the language barriers and so forth. Uh, I, I authored this, but I quote a lot of people, <laughs> including <laughs> Richard Valenzuela. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's um, pretty much how to, how to, to listen to to people, you know, when they cannot communicate, uh, tips on um, uh, tips on overcoming language barriers, and using cultural diversity to motivate people in order to contribute to to achieve uh, goals. Great. In a nutshell, what practical advice can you offer? Like Richard said before, I would have to. Uh, you know, quote him, and that is, we have to start looking into ourselves first and trying to find out what is, is within that is keeping us from reaching out. We need to be more open-minded, you know, and most of all, compassionate. Issues uh, of whatever kind uh, should be dealt with no matter who you're dealing with, you, you cannot just look down on a person and say, well, I'm not going to deal with you because you're not worth it to me. We are all in this together. Well, Alice, Richard, we're out of time. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. And thank you all for watching the show. If you'd like some more information, would like to find out about Extend Magazine or more about Anytown USA, uh, please give us a call at 602 Two six four zero nine eight six. Excuse me, zero nine eight six. Or, if you so choose, you could drop us a line. Care of One World, P.O. Box three two zero three five, Phoenix, Arizona eight five zero six four. Again, thanks for watching. I'm Bruce Benefield. Namaste.